Um, but uh, what we would do is we would take that 20% and we would average it out across, but implement it in a series of different discounts, you know, time-based ones, loyalty programs where you get free benefits and you achieve certain tiers, and then you get an average discount, you get access to free content. You know, you, you have like spend incentives to, you know, reach a certain objective. Then you get access to all of this, you know, um, kind of like exclusive content. And this is no bullshit gaming podcast, two and a half gamers, sharing actionable insights, dropping knowledge from our day-to-day -day user acquisition, game design, and ad monetization jobs we are definitely not discussing the latest industry news but having so much fun let's not forget this is a 4 a.m conference discussion vibe so let's not take it too seriously okay welcome everybody uh welcome to this special episode again special episode <laughs> we have a lot of those uh my name is Matija Lancharic I'm Felix Broberg and I'm Jakub Remier we are your hosts for today and we have two special guests we are joined by Justin Khan and Archie Stonehill from Stash. Hello. And, uh, hey, guys. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Can you can you give us a brief introduction of yourself and uh, maybe about company you work at? And uh, we can we can take it from there. Absolutely. Um, Justin, let's, let's start with oh, you. Yeah, let's start with you. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, so I'm Justin Kahn, uh, co-founder of Stash, and I've been in the games industry for a while. Uh, previously, I was a co one of the co-founders of Twitch, and uh, now we're back with uh, Stash, which is a gaming payments platform, and um, here with my co colleague, Archie. Nice. Yeah, I have to follow that. It's tough. I did not <laughs> go from Twitch. <laughs> Archie, I've uh, been in the games industry for less of a while than Justin, um, and uh, yeah, I had a product at Stash, and before that, I was an investor in a fund called Makers Fund, where I um, invested in games companies exclusively. So maybe before we start, um, I know I think uh, we saw you, Justin, with uh, with your previous uh, company, Fractal. Like, what? Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the pivot from from there to where you are at the moment? Because sure. it's, it's really interesting, uh, interesting situation. Yeah. So, so, um, about two and a half years ago, we started this company called Fractal, uh, which was building infrastructure for web three game companies. There's a lot of buzz around people who are trying to create, um, uh, web three games. And one of the things I really believed in was that more and more people around the world were spending more money in games and, um, that, that stuff that they would buy inside of games, you know, they would treat as real. It kind of went back to my own experience, like starting playing games over 20 years ago online when I was, I was a big Ultima Online fan. And um, when I was playing Ultima Online, I remember I, like there was they did not put enough space for houses in the land. Right. So like all every space that possibly could have a house was was taken. And then eventually, like people were selling trading these houses on eBay. And like I was a high school student, I couldn't afford it. But I remember thinking like, wow, it's crazy that people really value the things that are in this virtual world, you know, because it has such high meaning to them, because they put so much time and effort into these games. And so when I saw kind of um, games being built around NFTs and Web3, I was like, that's interesting. I think there's something to this idea that people are really believing that th these assets that they buy and earn in game are, are um, have like a durable, tangible value. Um, unfortunately the, we, so we launched this infrastructure to help web three games, uh, with their NFTs and, and the marketplace and, um, the market of games has like not matured very much. It's still pretty early. So, um, these games like didn't kind of come out to the point where they have like a massive <laughs> amount of adoption, like, uh, um, you know, normal games have. And, um, so after kind of searching around the industry, trying to figure out, okay, is there some angle we can take like we really uh listening to our customers you know game companies it became clear that what a lot of game companies wanted was help on the monetization side of their existing games that actually have tens of millions of players and so uh that's what we decided to do and we kind of uh turned the company into this new product stash which mm -hmm. is a payments platform for um gaming companies to uh sell uh you know, they're in-app in purchases um, via web shops. 
And so we, we allow you to create, we're kind of like Shopify for games. We allow you to easily set up a storefront um, that's accessible on mobile or desktop so that you, the you know end player, can go and, and buy stuff for the game on this web shop. Nice. Yeah, this is a kind of an emergency podcast about the like, latest Apple uh, kind of payment guidelines. And uh, yeah, I think uh, you are actually quite good fit to discuss these uh, these new payment processes options and, and everything that uh, it's available. Elise, can you can you give us a little bit like a background, like what happened actually? Then from we can the just last time. Uh, yeah, from the last so, time, yeah, it <laughs> changed quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so let me set this up. So uh, Apple has, for the first time, uh, allowed developers to choose to either remain uh, on their current payment conditions in the EU, which is essentially yeah, thirty percent IAP take rates, or was forced they can... to allow, by the way. Yeah, or forced oh, to allow. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because their arm is, you know, twisted behind their head, like uh, back, right? But uh, now developers in the EU have a choice between either the normal 30% take rate or choice. adopting, yeah, the new capabilities. Yeah, yeah. And the new capabilities are, as I quote, uh, where developers have additional <laughs> distribution and payment processing options available, Apple will apply reduced commission, an optional payment processing fee, and a fee for first annual installs above 1 million in the last 12 months. Mm. Where, so, where have we heard this thing before? Yeah, man, like they're putting it unity all over again. Issues, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it already cost, uh, you know, a billion dollar company, the CEO place. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. But maybe uh, maybe we can switch it over to you guys here. Like maybe in your own words, Archie and Justin, like what has Apple done? Why have they done it? And what is the impact for publishers on the App Store? Sure. Archie, you want to jump in? Yeah. So as you say, Apple has been forced. It was designated a gatekeeper under the Digital Markets Act. Um, maybe just talking about the Digital Markets Act uh, for a second. It's a fairly kind of groundbreaking piece of regulation for a few reasons. Um, one of them is that its objective is not the typical objective you see in antitrust action. Mm -hmm. Normally, antitrust action is, is to protect consumers from monopolistic pricing and stuff like that. The Digital Markets Act is actually oriented towards competitors of um, platform businesses. So it's meant to foster an environment that enables competitors to have a fair shot at challenging what they call gatekeepers in various ways in digital markets. That has a bunch of exciting implications because it's been very hard to kind of pin these big tech guys down on um, antitrust stuff because they give away all their stuff for free. So hard to prove consumer harm when you know you're giving things away for free. But um, as you say, there there were a kind of a couple of provisions that app stores um, uh, like had to comply by. The deadline for that is March sixth, um, and uh, you know. If you think about the App Store ecosystem, iOS owns the device, Apple owns the device, the operating system, um, the App Store, and then the payments layer after that. Um, what it can't do now, according to digital markets, is use any one of those control points, most particularly the operating system and the hardware, to force uh, to 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 like you know d destroy competition downstream. Um, in theory, Apple's first salvo at complying with that is of these new policies. You say they offered basically a choice between, it's a bit like setting up a choice um, and then being able to say to the EU, hey, look, they have two options. It's not awful. Yeah, yeah, of course. Option, so, yeah. It sounds really fair, is it? Yeah, and, of course. Uh, it depends if you think a, a choice, I mean, you know, it has to be a fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory choice. That is the terms of the legislation. Um I don't want to comment too much on, you know, I think it's no surprise that Apple is resisting this tooth and nail. No, of course, like it's their own money. Come on. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are kind of three ways in which uh, like Apple could be opening up. So one is um, allowing alternative app distribution, as you said. Um, another one is, um, you know, payments, uh, allowing alternative monetization channels in apps. Um, and then the third is non-app uh, uh, monetization and sales. It'll give up on payments the lost, I think. That's what it really cares about, is the payments volume for apps in the App Store. 
it is being forced to allow side loading. And to be fair, there are some viable products now with their side loading infrastructure, even if they do come with that alternative app store, um, you know, install fee. By the way, worth noting, it's only installs above a million on the app store. If you're distributing outside of the app store, you pay that core technology fee on the first install. Um, so, uh, you know, that that is uh, makes it very tough for any smaller company to do this. Um, and then out of app uh, payments, I think, has been the most immediate opportunity for a while. And a lot of the, you know, not only EU action, but American court action has opened that up even more. Um, um. Yeah. So, sorry, just to summarize this, because I think people maybe missed this kind of important thing. So this only applies to EU and EU states. And the US one is just the one with like, you are allowed to put that web link into your app that we regulate and approve, blah, blah, blah. And all these things that they're, they're not even this like new runtime fee options for it's US not, yeah, it's developers. Not there yet. It's not there yeah, yet. it's not there yet. So this is just for EU stuff. And the US stuff is just that web link that you can get approved by Apple to let the traffic out of your app into the web store and that's it. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. So the, yeah. yeah, the US regulation is now, or the US choice that you have is like, you can link out to an alternate payments um, provider and then we'll take, instead of 30%, Apple takes 27%. And, and it requires in, in case process. of payment, in, in, like, I in think case it's very important. In, like, if it's not a payment, just like, hello, this is a web store. <laughs> we will leave you to it. Yeah, it's... but you still don't understand. Like, if you are, if you already click on that link, you have a parameter in that URL that kind of stays with you unless you either unless the session or is, unless the session you know, ends. ends. Yeah, and, yeah, unless yeah, the session the ends. And they have a claim on any revenue made seven days after that pay, that click. However, there seven you go. days after yeah. the click, so you have okay. the, you have the you have the oh. win like seven day win attribution so get, window. So get rewarded for this reward after seven days of going yeah. to the web store. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can decide it already in my head. <laughs> you also have to buy for an entitlement. It's a night. I don't think. I think there's very few cases where click out where the link out makes sense. But yeah. having said that, there were two parts to the court ruling. The link out one has gotten the most attention. The other one was regarding communications about alternative payment methods. Previously, uh, developer guidelines 3.3 banned uh, developers from any, yeah. Yeah, any communication. So, that is, so now you can do a lot more to tell players about your web store and communicate with them, which is pretty powerful, actually. That's probably the most exciting thing, I think, that's come out in the last couple of days is the communication stuff. Yeah, okay, so potentially you can just communicate, hey, we have a web shop, you don't put link into that uh, message and they're like, yeah, okay. But then you there still, you, you can communicate, so you still need to pay 27%, but how, how they can track that? No, it's right? only if you yeah. link out. You need to yeah, pay. Okay. By the way, you actually need to still be a bit careful, but Rovio just launched a pop-up in their app store, in their apps, where they say, join the Rovio club on their website, uh, and that then leads to a web store. So Rovio is already taking advantage of this. Yeah, because this, this, this was always like my point, even like the previous ones, like the point is just to move the payers to the web store. It's like one time kind of movement that cannot be then stopped by Apple. Like if they're already there, like they can't stop them from paying in the web store if there's better prices there. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, right. link out, think, I... like developers are going to be highly incentivized, especially if they do customer segmentation to figure out who their best customers are to go and move those customers to their web store. And they, you know, they can do that through, we think of like many different mechanisms, you know, they can do it by creating these clubs or memberships or di discounts, or, you know, even just reaching out and telling the users on an individual basis uh, through different channels, communication channels about their web store. So I think I think about the Acubes, uh you can have also let's say your own community and then you can push in, in your community your web shop like hey we have the web shop and like there you go you have already like your best community there uh, yeah of course but again it's a, it's a matter of like you know KPIs like if most of your DAU is sitting on the mobile store and they're not in the discord reddit whatever somewhere else like you need to get those pairs off there that's well, the thing. most of the payer DAU then yeah, in that case exactly. yeah yeah yeah, this would not be viable if it weren't for whale monetization in free-to-play games. And in fact, like when we set up Stash, this is already a market that's huge, right? So Playtika is doing 25% of its revenue for, through direct-to-consumer channels, namely web. Huge is doing about 10% of its revenue. Plarium is doing 30% direct-to-consumer. 
Like these guys are already doing this. I've been surprised by how much the big guys are already doing this and just keeping quiet about it. Yeah, how do they do it? Because they're, you know, social casino mainly companies which have very high LTV. Yeah, users. how do they, they really do care about Like, how do they do it physically? How do they get them out of the store? So they they move their top zero point five percent by like you know very high touch account management services, uh, a really good rewards program that Playtika has that incentivizes use of these channels. Like, you're never going to be able to offer a more convenient experience going through the web store, a direct consumer channel. So you've got to offer a better experience, and that's what we do. Um, but if you do that, players love it. Okay, because yeah. <clears throat> Social casino already like have these VIP programs for years, right? Like they know how to identify their high, high target players and they treat them well. Let's call it that way. They treat them well. It's happening yeah. also like in, in strategy games and in other genres. Yeah, strategy, exactly. Strategy games, anything that's cross platform, like Scopely's had a real success doing this. So's Fun Plus. There's a bunch of companies, even outside casino. Rovio's pushing it hard. It'll be see, it'll be very interesting to see how Angry Birds does with this. I, I'm curious if that works. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So I mean, we we had this, uh, but we can we can get back to to actually the the Apple kind of fun stuff that happened last week because we played around the, the Apple calculator. Yeah. As let well. me let me get it up here. Here <laughs> we go. Played. Let me open it. Yes, let me open do. up. I also read so, something about like this uh, absolutely enormous fee for Instagram, WhatsApp, and stuff, something else, like millions of of, uh, of dollars per month, not even per year or whatever. Yeah. Was that. Yeah. Let, me, let me talk it through because you guys are the experts, right? So I inputted the download and install IAP numbers for Activision King's uh, mobile iOS platform. So basically... This is how much last year in 2023 they earned in IAPs in the EU uh, from these many installs. And it's confusing because this is monthly, this is yearly. So I guess they're trying to confuse you already here, right? But are you guys the alternative app marketplaces or alternative payment processors? No. So there's kind of three different things you can do. So Okay. Um so the first is you could pay uh, via your um, by via Apple IAP, right? That's that's the status quo. The second is you can adopt the alternative terms, and then the third is you can monetize those players in other places like the web. Um, yeah. So we are that third category primarily. I mean, you know, obviously we are looking at side loading very closely, and I think as this evolves, we'll figure it out. What Apple's policy does is make it so that you have to go all the way when you adopt their alternative terms. Um, so you have to choose between the status quo and can, that. Fee. Can you go back afterwards? It doesn't. That I actually don't haven't gotten clarity on that. Mm. It's it, it not totally clear, depending on what you do under the context of the alternative terms, because the alternative mm. terms include both alternative payments providers, link out in Europe is under the alternative terms, and alternative app distribution. Also, does it say if, if I can have one game on one terms one term and then the other game on, on the alternative? Um, so long as they are truly different games, yes. Um, okay. But, what uh, does it mean truly different games in that case? I mean, that's quite confusing. That's the App Store review process. Oh, okay, right. okay, okay, good. <laughs> Interesting. I would guess a different ID. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. So... What do I put here in the number? Like, what, what, what is a chart? What do you guys charge? Like, so we just get an understanding here, or, or this calculator is it pointless, or is it actually like worth to play around with? No, it's useful. I mean, I think if you click that drop down, uh, you get a set of options in the top right. Um, yeah. So it's a balance of what you're doing and how successful you're doing it. So, but actually, the thresholds are pretty easy. So if you adopt the alternative terms, then you have to pay a fee that costs, consists of two parts. So one is a reduced commission to Apple on App Store installs. Um, you pay no commission on installs outside the App Store. And then on all installs, apart from your first million via the App Store, you pay your 50 cent fee. So you have two types of distribution for apps. You have the App Store. On those, you don't pay the install fee until the millionth and first install. But on all revenue, you pay 20%. Through app, out of app installs, you pay 50%, 50 cent fee from day one. Um, now the, the the kind of the, the upshot is if your annual monetization per user is greater than five euros, then this makes economic sense for you, because okay. you know the ten percent difference in the in the commission 
even if you don't go out through out of app uh, out of app store distribution then you just switch to a 50 cent install above a million and a 20 percent fee so um what that means is that like the 20% fee versus 30% fee difference, i.e. that 10%. So long as that's greater than or equal to 50 cents, then you're saving money by going for that. Uh, it's very confusing, but um, if you... if you Absolutely multi- confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And deliberately so, I would say. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Money. One, one, one important tidbit. Do I get it right that you also pay the 50 cent runtime, whatever fee bullshit, by updates? To the app. Uh, yes, but you pay it once a year. That's why I would say yeah. also once a year only. So one install fee and one update fee. Because you know how how many updates these games have, like literally every two weeks or something. Install and um, update updates count as install for existing apps, basically. So you have to think about it like a recurring annual fee. Hmm. But, but for uh, every update. No, just you only pay it once per per device per year. Okay. So, so like updates so if, yeah, if are you the do... same. Yeah, mm-hmm. if you if you make ten updates, then it's still the one install, basically. Yeah. You... <clears throat> but again, you know, you're saving a ten percent. You're saving ten percent on your app store revenue and paying no app store fees out of app. Mm-hmm. Out of app. So all, all the calculator so is supposed to do is just scare, scare us. Yeah, it makes sense if your revenue right per user per install is above five dollars or five euro. So high, high volume loyalty EV games are pretty much like out of this debate immediately. They just exited the door. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. In that case, yeah, low low DAU, high high LTV as like strategy games. But it's like it comes down comes down again to what we discussed just now, like strategy games, mid core games, social casino. You mean like whole Japanese market? <laughs> 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 okay, fair enough. Yes. If you have a game where you're making, especially if you can target the users, I mean, if if you're making, you know, $25 per install, which isn't crazy for a lot of games, this saves you a lot of money. I mean, it can basically halve your fees in many cases, depending on the Yeah, type. but it's, you know what, it's not like your CPI is 50 cents as well. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> you no. Make, you make $25, but you, you also pay like 20 30 I, sometimes, you know? CPI, like, yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. I'm getting, you know, you you you're getting more than ten percent additional revenue without doing anything other than switching terms. True. That's a fair point. But then, like I know, Apple will do everything they they can just to to make this as scary as possible. By the way, what's what's uh, you know, who's where's the guarantee that they cannot just raise the fee? I mean, the fifty cents one, they, they, or, or like you know, you know where I'm heading here. <laughs> they, they could at some point. It, it's fair. Um, uh, yeah, they could. I mean, that's that's the fear, right? Like, like once they see, for instance, just as you said, like, oh, this works great for high TV games. Then, like, half the market of high TV games switches there. Apple sees like whatever five billion less revenue, and they're like, oh, by the way, we're increasing the fee from fifty cents to two dollars, or whatever they match your LTV kind of threshold. Hey, uh, I can imagine us having this conversation five years ago and saying, hey, what if they get rid of the IDFA? And being like, wouldn't that <laughs> yeah, no way, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do that, of course. <laughs> oh my god okay but now uh so how much uh how much um should companies like expect to pay if it you know if they go to like external partners kind of like anything uh also does it affect like volumes uh and uh and stuff like that justin do you want to take that or should i oh go ahead so it does depend on volume and it depends on where your users are and how they're paying. Um, so fortunately for us, like whales tend to pay with low cost methods. Uh, so our model at Stash is, well, at the at the beginning, to be honest, right now we're in a kind of like, uh, we're trying to innovate, we're trying to partner with really good devs. And so we're not charging um, uh, a commission, but you have a cost to each transaction. Um, and so that cost averages out at $5 uh, five sorry five percent on a transaction um that's probably high for for who your users typically are if your users are kind of using carrier billing network carrier billing in africa you're going to pay a lot more if they're just using credit cards in america you're going to pay a lot less so y- you can expect to pay low single digit percents um but one thing i'll note and this is quite hard to explain 
But when oh. people think about how much money Apple takes versus their revenue, they think about it often very wrong because Apple takes 30%, developers get 70%. Um, and so developers think that uh, Apple gets 30% of their revenue, but their revenue isn't the 100%, it's the 70%. So the ratio isn't 10 to 3 developer to Apple, it's 7 to 3. So in fact, um, the additional revenue that you get from Apple is 43% of net revenue, i.e. your developer revenue, not 30%. So there's always a lot more spend there than um, developers think. I don't know if that confused everyone. <laughs> a little bit. It was like, yeah, I can't even spell that. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> All that's to say that the actual gross revenue figure is much higher than you might imagine. Yeah, still not helping, Archie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. yeah, but for the for the yeah, but, yeah. but for those five percent, right? So if if a developer chooses to work with you, uh, what do you guys do? Are you guys a merchant of record? Like, what, what? How does it work? Uh, yeah, all of that. We we view our role as to be like both the kind of technical payment provider, so doing merchant of record compliance, tax collection, et cetera. So you don't even have to worry about that, and to enable the best possible direct consumer strategy with you know lots of e-commerce uh, kind of techniques, design. Um, additional features that we can go into if you're interested in, but yes, yeah, yeah we more. do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nom, 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 nom. definitely. I've seen some offer segmentation, whatever discount price policy there. So really curious about that. Yeah, one. yeah. So the thinking is that, like you know, games for the entire industry's history have been intermediated by platforms. First, the consoles, and then you know, mobile and Steam. And so they've never operated direct to consumer channels successfully, with a couple exceptions like Riot and Roblox and um, Epic. And so, you know, we don't really have these expertise in the games industry on how to do this. We've relied really heavily on, you know, these platforms uh, to do this. Uh, and so we have been, you know, bringing in expertise from other industries that have done this very successfully. Um, there's a couple I can flag. So for example, hospitality, like hotels and airlines have maintained very successful direct consumer strategies. Um, and they're quite similar to games because the additional cost to them per user or per customer isn't actually meaningful. So it doesn't cost you any more if you're a hotel to have someone stay in a room if you're not at full occupancy. The real cost is operating the hotel. It doesn't matter if you have 99 out of 100 guests or 100 out of 100 guests. Same with an airline. The cost is flying the flight, not per passenger. So that's why they're able to offer very generous reward programs and loyalty programs. Mm. Or even in games, it's even better, right? There's no incremental cost to another skin. So think about all the benefits you can offer a a, a user to come to your direct consumer channel, um, you know, with additional exclusive content, cosmetics, and stuff like that. So there's really exciting stuff we're looking at designing there that's similar to hotel and rewards. We're also looking at stuff like fashion, which successfully went from uh, to intermediated to direct consumer online, and then real money is the other big one, casinos. But this doesn't apply to power progression economies, does it? Well, you can tie it. I think it's best done when you tie it into your, um, well, it depends which market. If you're in a pay to win one, it may work, well, right? Like, um, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's best done when you tie it into game design, right? We're, we've got, so a lot of what we do is trying to take your objectives for your e commerce channel and translate them into the best possible implementation and most. Archie, 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 wait, wait, wait. Yeah. If you didn't know, like, there's no bullshit. Yeah, it was a lot of bullshit. That's like, you know, it's very vague. It's very oh, vague. Yeah. I know, I know. I know. It's very Can you show vague. us something, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, not bullshit. Like, what? Uh, it sounds on. great. You say that they, you operate like a channel, you operate a game that has, um, and you want to like drive a direct consumer like channel. Sorry, give me a sec. There you go. Um, yeah, that's the bull. That's the, you know, that's the what's the, the, the bullshit. No meter bullshit there. That, that, yeah, that was a warning. The, yeah, <laughs> that was a warning. <laughs> <laughs> that was a warning right there. It's mm. exactly yeah, yeah. No, we yeah. sorry, I interrupted. Okay, yeah, so that was the no call. bullshit pol yeah, <laughs> police. Yeah, no bullshit, no bullshit police. Yeah. Ring the door. <laughs> All right, sorry, yeah, go, go on, go on. <laughs> um, so say you're operating a direct consumer channel and you want to you wanna incentivize users to go there. You can essentially like be like, hey, Stash, we want to offer you know, a 20% benefit to users for using our channel. And what you could do is just offer a flat 20% discount on your website. That's fine. It's not super engaging or compelling or, or, or kind of well, well implemented. Um, but 
uh, what we would do is we would take that 20% and we would average it out across, but implement it in a series of different discounts, you know, time-based ones, loyalty programs where you get free benefits and you achieve certain tiers, and then you get an average discount, you get access to free content. You know, you, you have like spend incentives to, you know, reach a certain objective, then you get access to all of this, you know, um, kind of like exclusive content. And you know, that would be done in a way that drives engagement, rewards loyalty, increases retention, just boosts your overall spend in LTV, but it would all net out at, um, a, at a 20% discount. So you would still be able to have control over the overall kind of like exchange of value, trying to get people to use this uh, web channel. But we would, we would kind of handle the best possible implementation, both from a kind of architecting the system perspective and in terms of implementing it in terms of a design perspective. Um, Can you show that, us an example? Before we, Jakub just yeah. goes in, <coughs> this we sounds know, like... But if you stay, stay tuned, you will see some. Okay, good. Because okay. This sounds like special for system to me. And also like a lot, lot of work and resources. I, yeah. I would say we're investing really heavily in our initial customers. There's a version okay. of that, I think, that can be templatized, but, you know, uh, this is best done when in coordination with a game economist, right? And and thinking through what are the kind of perceived mm. object value you can give away. So cosmetics or that, that actually don't cannibalize your spend. And that's something yeah. we have to very closely with those developers. Okay. It sounds like you also need to have someone in the house in terms of either economy or game design or something. Yeah. Yeah. We have some, you know, kind of uh, advisable <laughs> stuff there, but I think Ideally, that... okay. The problem with economists is they're fairly specific to game genres and types. And yeah. so hiring one person there, I think, is suboptimal versus having a network of people who can advise us. But truthfully, I actually think our job is more about the implementation of the incentive and that a lot of this work would be done based on your knowledge of your own game economy. Hmm. It's the same thing, like, you know, it's systems, like game economy, like the numbers game won't help you if you don't have the boxes to, you know, put the numbers in. It's the, like usual thing. Okay. That's example, by the way, there's a bunch more. Like, yeah, I can go into them, but I don't want to drone on. No, no, no. Like, yeah, we, we, okay, so that was really, really interesting. And so, as, what can I do in terms of like the marketing perspective for with the web shops and like how, how you think about it and how you can help companies actually drive, let's say, more traffic to, to the web shops? Uh, yeah. So we're, we're working closely with some of the MMPs on thinking about like interesting ways to do crop marks and attribution. Like one of the best things about web and having a web shop is you get your, you get ownership of your own, your own players, right? Like that actually becomes your customer when you're interacting with yeah. them directly. Um, and so thinking through what we can do to either use web inventory to drive conversion to a web shop or, um, you know, how you can, uh, like, I think that using this as a way to acquire new users without launching a cross-platform product is something that's probably a secondary challenge, right? I think that there's some BS I could spew about like creating lookalike audiences that you would definitely call me out on here. Um, but I no, think for yeah, we yeah we just discussed this be uh, before we started. Sure. Like, yep. Okay, yeah. because yeah, I could ask me. Okay, well, 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 how What's do you use here? yeah? What's the advantage yeah. to use email? And it's like, yeah, you can, yeah, you can use lookalikes. You can use, you can build audiences. You can then retarget them and get Always them to web shop. But right. then, like in overall, like marketing kind of point of view, you talk to your customer like that's the direct contact. <laughs> you know, you can use it with e like uh, emails, whatever. It's just yeah, that's the way you can you can talk to, to your player, which is really yeah. powerful. It doesn't really? need to be UA or remarketing. It can be for free. Yeah, it's like you can leave leverage, yeah, email marketing, whatever else. It, and it's email, like direct email permissions. So yeah. you're not even kind of targeting them exactly. And retargeting is massive, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes all, yeah, that's that's uh, what we touched a little bit. Like you build audience on Facebook, Google, re retargeting, or whatever platforms, TikTok. And then, yeah, you just send them to web shops because, yeah, hey, hello. We didn't yeah. see you for a while. This is a great special offer we have on our web shop, and we just we don't want to pay thirty percent to Apple. Let's go. <laughs> we'll give you something for free. <laughs> I think that if you look at almost all the web shops that are out there today, they're essentially that. They're like, hey guys, we all know what's going on. We save exactly like that. 
and and they're successful amazingly. So I'm like, well, what actually happens when you productize these really well in a web yeah. commerce way? Yeah, well, that that would be like uh, so that would make you different from from all the other other guys. Yeah, and the other thing I'll add is that like we don't view the web environment as just a shop, right? So I think that part of this, like, we are not a web shop business. We're a, we're a direct consumer business, and a lot of that is about enabling experiences that are you know really valuable for players and that they enjoy and enhance their experience of the game. And th that varies a lot by the type of game, but you know if you're a competitive multiplayer game. I think for a kind of like, you know, MMO, I think this web environment would be somewhere you have like a social discovery tool where players can find people to do raids with or find competitive uh, teams they want to play with. And, um, you know, like find experiences that are really enriching for the game, bring traffic to the web environment, um, tie in very naturally with your game, a pretty low effort to build, um, mm. but broaden out the ways in which your players interact directly with you. So low effort to build, like... How quickly well, we, I can build a web shop or yeah, whatever. I mean, it, we, it we, sound complicated. <laughs> so we do the complicated stuff, Felix. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, okay. It's all effort for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, okay. Hey, Archie, I, I need the web shop. And you say, look, uh, I will give you a call in seven days. That'll be 5%. I'll call you in five days. <laughs> we could do it in five days, but it would be so. <laughs> I would say we would need to do, I think it would be much better to do it. And we only want to do things that are kind of like, well made and serious efforts at doing this in a premium way that you know okay um, yeah. in that que in that uh, case question like uh, what's well made and how the well well made web shop look like <laughs> well I, I can show you some of our mocks if you yes like. yeah go know. yeah yeah nom, 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 nom. <laughs> yes <clears throat> some of them others uh super yeah. solid fairly well done from a ux perspective which mm. many of them aren't but i don't think any of them are really like e-commerce experiences, compare them to anything you buy at like a, you know, fashion yeah. experience. Yeah, I think, actually, was it you on LinkedIn that uh, mentioned like, I think two years ago, the the buzzword was web free, last, last year was AI, and then now it's web shops. Yeah, amazingly. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's like, that's it basically. And it really kind of gets to the like different segment of like this all online marketing because then you, you need to have the web shop i guess visible for for everybody uh you need to have pretty good search engine optimization and on page seo then maybe some link building and then obviously like conversion optimization on on that web shop like you know you, all of these things that kind of are still out there just on like landing pages and just outside of gaming basically just now coming back to gaming uh just i mean just in interesting yeah, <laughs> just by the way, <laughs> by the way, from... when I when I joined Stash, we spoke about with Justin. Like the team we've built is a bunch of engineers who have spent a lot of time, uh, you know, working on broader web development, mm. and uh, and I think that that shows in the quality of product we build. Our linking experience for our demo is, I think, the smoothest you could imagine. There's no entry of account details, and then similarly, you know, when you arrive at the page for so many web shops, you're blocked from seeing anything. And with a modal window until you enter your username or account details, like that's so suboptimal, right? So our flow <laughs> is fully designed like, you know, the best possible e-commerce one to, you know, get users bought into the experience, show them what they're gaining, then try and get their email. But if not having a frictionless way for them to link their accounts, I think this stuff is not, um, it's, it's like, you know, not easy, but it's um, a set of expertise that like exists, right? Well, they exist, yeah. <laughs> You can yeah. borrow them from yeah, <clears throat> anywhere online marketing people. Like that's that's what I've done like 13 years ago <laughs> before before I yeah I joined the gaming industry. It's like yeah, it's it's there. Like people do do this uh, for a living. Oh, it's absolutely that. interesting. Yeah, your former life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, any anything else that we we need to cover, guys? Uh, that you have on on your mind that we should definitely definitely touch. Um, yeah. I would have, yeah, yeah. as usual. As I usual, of course. Yeah. I would yeah, have the I question regarding afraid. the the loyalty program because this is pretty much like like out uh, right out of my mind. Like the question is like, it's loyalty within the stash ecosystem or loyalty within the game ecosystem, or like if you can like uh, elaborate a little bit on that one because I'm just kind of. Yeah, sounds to me a little, little bit like overwall or you know these things, which I don't think so. It is. Yeah, no, no, no. So to be clear, this this is enabling you. Uh, this is not us kind of trying to trying to be like um, the stash ecosystem. This is like your branded loyalty program. Mm. 
Yeah, philosophically, you know, we think about Stash as our job is to help the game developers and it's a white label experience. You know, I don't think game developers want to trade one platform disintermediation yeah, the other, of course. for like stash is intermediation, you know, like, so we were successful if we can help people, you know, with a Shopify like experience where the, the brand, the game owns the experience, right. All the way to the customer and they own the customer relationship. And I think that's what games want, you know, you don't want to charge 30% then. Well, that, yeah. not, not now, so, not now, not, not, not now. Not now, no. Stage two. <laughs> That's yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> by the way, we, we we operate in a competitive market, and so you know, if you want to switch from Stash in two years' time, you're going to be able to do that, and and that's the core difference, right? Um, I mean, we're confident you won't because we'll be so excellent and give you a, a experience you love, but um, you know, that's on us to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's your job. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Uh, right, good. Watch about radio, oh. to be honest. Yeah. And on that bombshell, I think it's time to end. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Do you want to Thanks, take us guys. home, Ache? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for coming. Uh, please subscribe. Uh, we will put uh, Justin and Archie your um, information in the show notes and also link to Stash. So, uh, guys, if you want to reach out, definitely reach out. And thank you. See you next time. Cheers. Thanks, guys. See ya. Thank you. Thank you.